Hi, welcome to the Call Within podcast. I'm your host, Amy Hogan. I'm a life coach, retreat leader, and breathwork facilitator who is here to support you in taking consistent action on your dreams to live a life of meaning and pleasure. I'll share with you insights, tools, and stories to help you answer the call within. Let the adventure begin. Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 15. I hope wherever you are in the world and whatever time of day it is that you're listening to this episode that you are feeling well. On a personal note, I've been sick for probably, it's been since the Canadian Thanksgiving weekend, so I think that's about five weeks now. I got sick with COVID for the first time first, and then it got followed up by a really terrible cold that's been hanging on. So yeah, I hope that you are feeling better and feeling healthy and feeling energized and being able to take care of yourself with all the the sickness and and whatnot that is going around. You know, sometimes I find that it can be very easy to become down or, you know, sort of like downtrodden, pessimistic about the state of the world and things that are happening. And whenever I do these interviews and then I go back and listen to them more carefully through the editing process, I'm always reminded of how many really good people there are in the world and how many people are doing really amazing work to make a difference for people. And I hope that's the message that you will take away from today's interview with Amina Muhammad. Amina has always had a passion for photography. She spent 15 years exploring this passion while working in film and television as a producer and production manager on numerous movies and documentaries. In 2018, she started a for-profit travel business called Triple F Photo Tours and an initiative called Camera for Girls, which was granted charity status in 2021. Through Cameras for Girls, her mission is to teach photography and business skills to marginalized females across Africa who endeavor to become journalists. She gives them a camera to keep and a four-phase program that empowers them to find paid work and escape poverty. She's taught 32 young women via an in-person workshop in Uganda and 10 women online in South Africa, and now 55% of those women have full-time jobs. Most recently, Amina returned to Uganda this past June 2022 to resume the in-person workshop for Camera for Girls. Through both the for-profit and non-profit ventures, Amina has been featured in the press across Canada and the U.S. Let's dive in. Welcome, Amina. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you. Yeah, I cannot wait to hear more about your story and for you to share with everyone about your story and about Cameras for Girls. It is an amazing organization that you've created and it seems like it's really impacting a lot of people in a really empowering and meaningful way. Thank you so much. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself first and, you know, how you came to Canada and, and that story? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so last uh, Friday, actually, October 28th was our 50 year anniversary being in Canada. Um, we are refugees. We came from Uganda and I was three at the time. We came to Canada uh, under duress because then President uh, Idi Amin, um, the butcher of Uganda, some call him, kicked all the Asians out with only three months notice. And as I mentioned, I was three. My parents were very young, 25 and 27, I think. And uh, oh, then there was my sister. And we were rendered stateless. Um, they had stripped us of all of our nationality, of our papers. And uh, uh, now Trudeau, um, his father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, through his friendship with the Aga Khan, you know, made an appeal. Uh, there was an appeal made and he agreed to bring in Um, over, I think, 6,000 at first, and eventually 8,000 Asians from uh, Uganda. I think there was like 30 planes or something leaving in those three months. It was crazy. So we settled in, uh, we came to Montreal, got processed, and then we settled in St. Catharines, and then eventually Burlington, where my parents lived 
until last year when they moved in with us up here in the Kawarthas in Manila. I'm married uh, 20 years now. God, I just aged myself. And I have a 15-year-old daughter. Uh, and uh, she has special needs, but she has come so far uh, this last two years. We're just so proud. That was the impetus for me starting Cameras for Girls. Yeah, the impetus being coming to Canada. But then you also talked about your daughter. Like, well, does it, she have an impact on it too? No, yes and no. So um, we had, uh, you know, I, I had grown up listening to the stories about what life was like in Uganda, all the beauty. Uh, Uganda is known as the Pearl of Africa. And it truly is because it's just so stunning. Um, we, My parents didn't talk about the poverty. They didn't because there was not any poverty when they lived there, right? It was um, at least not for the Asians, maybe for the Africans, but they didn't talk about that. And so I went back, you know, in 2007 to do a documentary because many of the Asians were returning to reclaim properties that were stolen. Um, and I wanted to tell that story. And, but when I got there, um, aside from doing the story, I saw immense poverty that grows year after year. I saw the plight of girls uh, and it shook me to my core. Here I was, had grown up in Canada with many opportunities that I squandered in my youth out of either stupidity or not knowing any better. Um, I also grew up in a strict Muslim household because, you know, it's like, you let the, what do you call the animal out of the pen and they're going to go crazy. That was me. And so I go back in 2007 and I met girls who were being married off at the young age of 14. Uh, and by the time they're in their mid twenties, they've got three to five children and they don't know how to clothe, educate or feed them. And the cycle of poverty just continues. Women were being told that they had no rights for education simply because they were born females. And I, you know, I, it, it really upset me. It made me angry, but I didn't know at the time what to do about it or how to help. So you come back, my life resumed, but in the back of my head was always um, this thing about Uganda. It, I was not born in Uganda. I'm the only one out of my family. I was born in England, but I'm the only one who considers myself to be Ugandan and where I have a deep connection with that country. It's just a part of me. And I knew I wanted to do something. So in 2017, after finishing a 15 year career working in film and television and had gone through hell with my daughter, who was adopted at three, a lot of struggling to get supports and, um, you know, navigate this whole new relationship with uh, adopting a child and trying to get a child to love me who wasn't mine and vice versa. I had gone through a lot of depression. I came up with the idea of putting my love and passion for photography into something good. And I literally woke up in the middle of the night and said, I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. And my husband said, oh shit, here we go again. Because I'm always coming up with crazy ideas and not all of them work, but this one, you know, I was determined to make something of it. So I stayed up the rest of the night because I have insomnia, um, writing out a plan. And in 2018, I was in Uganda doing our first training with 15 young girls with any camera that I could get my hands on, not knowing what the hell I was doing. And the in, in the beginning, the idea was just to go to Uganda and teach girls photography. But I didn't think that the end result would be job creation. It would just be teach them a skill and get them out of poverty. But that piece was missing. It was my photographer. Uh, it was my journalism friend, Venix, who's like a brother to me, who said to me, you need to teach girls who are going through journalism. And my Canadian mentality said, why would they, why would they need me? Like, what can I do for girls in Africa that are going through journalism? And he explained that a girl cannot get work in journalism unless she owns a camera and knows how to use it, but a guy can. And I was like, bingo. So we come in and we fit that gap, right? We give the girls a camera to keep and we teach her over a four phase program how to use that camera and in the end, help her get a job. And so, yeah, it's become something completely yeah, magical, I'd say. There's so much in what you said. I, I know. What, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you think it is that, like you said, even though you weren't born 
in Uganda, but did you live there for the first like three yes. and a half years of your life? Yeah. So I was born in England. We moved to Uganda when I was nine months old. And then yeah. we were in Uganda until we got kicked out. So at three and a half, basically. What do you think it is that, know. like you said, you're the only one in your family that considers yourself a Ugandan and it's always yeah. been a part of you. Sounds Yeah. Like. I don't know. It's everything from the music, the culture, the people, I just, you know, I am so grateful for the life we've had in Canada um, and the opportunities. But when I go back, I just feel that's where I belong. And it doesn't make sense to people, but I listen to the music. My mom said I could uh, I could dance before I could walk. I'd hear African music and I'd go crazy. <laughs> I would dress up in African clothing where everybody else was sort of still living in there, like starting to amalgamate. It was just everything about it. And you know, I, I talk about it and I can almost tear up because every, there's not a day that goes by where I don't think about Uganda or the people or the talk about it and want to go back. And, you know, I'm married to a Dane who's never been. And he's like, you know, he's become Canadianized uh, with, you know, and he's like, you're just crazy. And I'm like, nope, I'm giving you seven years. You better make up your mind because I'm going. <laughs> that kind of I thing. I love it. And I can <laughs> totally relate to waking up and be like, this is what I'm going to do. And having your husband be, go and be like, oh, no, this thing exactly. again. <laughs> Life's too short. Life's too it short, is. right? You have to live out your dreams. You have to you have to live for a bigger purpose. That's what my, mm. I think. You have to live a, for a bigger yeah. purpose. So when you look back, like what had you go in 2007 originally? Like that was your first yeah. time being there. That right? was my first time. So I worked in film and television. I started out in the wardrobe department. My last film in wardrobe was American Psycho. Um, yeah, which was awesome. And then I went back to school to learn and did a graduate program in film with the idea to come out and produce. So I started producing uh, music videos and commercials to start with, and then um, short films. My first short film went to TIFF, and then I went into the documentary. You know, I pitched, I, um, I won a fellowship basically to do a documentary. And when I was coming up with different ideas, I kept on reading about Asians, including my own uncles, had gone back to start and claim their property. I'm like, ooh there's the idea. So I pitched it and I was told, yes, we will, TBO would buy it as long as I paid to get it done. However, our friends at TV, Omar Sajudina, was also in Uganda, unbeknownst to me, doing the same story at the same time. And he had, you know, CTV behind him. And so he had two weeks, he put it together and it was on the news and I was dead in the water. But I came home, I had a seven minute preview which I still keep and I will hopefully one day finish that documentary in a different way but it gave me so much more than just finishing the documentary it gave me an eye into my future into you know I never could find where I belonged in this world I had an incredible career in film and television which I forget which I miss every single day but I can't do those 18 to 21 hour days anymore. I'm too old for it. And things have changed. But it opened up my eyes as a, as a young Muslim girl growing up in that kind of community about how bigger the world would, could be and how I could find my voice. That helped me to find the rest of my life, right? And, and I hate to say it, but in my 50s, I found my passion for life <laughs> where, I'm, where I'm meant to make the most impact. So that just says it's never too late, never too late to find what makes you passionate and want to get up every day and make a difference in the world. It's so cool what you're saying, how life you're meant to have like a passion and a purpose. And you it's like you found yourself and you know what you're supposed to be doing. And as you're talking it, I'm like, oh, I wonder if that's like how the girls in your in the program feel. It's almost like you're giving them this this like lens or medium through which to like see life and then they get to then tell their own stories and create their own stories. Yeah, absolutely. And I say to the girls that look, all of the stuff that we give you, the tools, the resources, the training, it's all free. Free does not mean there's no value. Free means that I'm coming in and giving you this with my team of volunteers. We're investing in you. I expect you to invest as much or if not more in yourself. So there are many girls who want this opportunity, but we can only have resources 
for 15 at a time. And so if you don't want to take it full advantage, excuse yourself, turn in your camera and make room for the next girl who does want it. Because it's taken me a long time to just build it up to this, to get those resources for them. We don't have a lot of funding because we're a Canadian charity working in Africa. So we're locked out of like, you know, government funding and and uh, family foundations for the most part. So we're having to be creative with how we find that funding. And so it's it's uh, I'm, I'm trying to empower them to against societal norms that tells them that their place is only in the home having children or only in the home to take care of the household or getting married at this young age. Use the tools, tell your stories, use your voice, empower others to come after you and change their lives, right? And so that's that's what we're trying to build. How do you pick the women for the program? So we, because we work in the journalism, we work with universities in the country. So right now I have partnerships in Uganda with Macquarie University and Uganda Christian University, and I recruit through them. So they'll do the recruitment process. I'll get all the applications and along with their input, I will finalize the 15 girls that are going to go through the training. And I have to say it's a four phase training program. So it's not just me going into the country, giving them a camera and over four days teaching them and then coming home and saying, good luck. <laughs> um, what we do is we work with them for four days in the country. The first three days is teaching them how to actually operate the camera. Uh, we break it down into the nitty gritty so that they get to understand the mechanics of the camera, how to hold the camera, but also aperture, shutter, ISO. Um, and then we do a lot of practicing with them and feedback on their photos so that they can understand, you know, what makes a good photo, what makes a good story. We go into storytelling. On the fourth day, we work with a local NGO who uh, gives us access so the girls can get field practice. In that field practice, they get to meet the beneficiaries of the NGO. They get to learn how to build a story from the ground up by interviewing, you know, researching the story, telling the story, and then they have to put it all together with a 500 word article and minimum of 10 photos that the NGO gets for their marketing. But then the girls get true field experience and know how to go in the field and do this over and over again. And then phase two happens when I come home to Canada for a whole year. We meet online every Friday for the first hour. I teach them photography or storytelling. And now I'm starting to bring other photographers into the mix so they get different voice than mine. And then the second hour, we cover like reviewing their photos that they've been taking or any assignments that I've given out. Or um, I've also started having them like now early on uh, build a LinkedIn profile rather than wait later because some of them are graduating and starting to get out into the world looking for jobs. Phase three happens uh, with a business skills. So some of them say, screw this, uh, you know, journalism thing. I want to do photography. I really have a passion for it. But how do I get myself seen? So we go into building business plans and budgeting and savings because they might earn a very little bit, but if they can put even 10% away for themselves for that proverbial rainy day, because the government does not support them, they're going to be better off for it, right? Because females don't have autonomy. And that's what I'm teaching. Get your autonomy. Uh, whether you have children or not, whether you have a husband or not, get autonomy. And then phase four is for those girls who've still not reached that goal um, or haven't found their way, I set them up with mentorship. Um, usually starting at six months. And if six months doesn't feed it, then up to the mentor to continue, but up to a year. And it's, you know, to date, 47 girls in Uganda and 65% now have full-time jobs. Yeah. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so we've built an online platform as well so that they can learn at their leisure, uh, photography, storytelling, business skills, see interviews with other girls, other women around the world who are doing what they want to do, but also in Uganda, um, open up the world to them, right? And show them that if you if you want this and you work hard for it, doesn't matter where you come from or how much money or you don't have, you can make it happen. Do you find there's, it sounds like, you know, there is local support 
right? Yeah. Like, is there local, yeah. is there like pushback? Cause it sounds like you're doing something that is against the culture, if that's even the right word or how it goes there. It's almost like they maybe have grown up one way and then you're introducing like another way of being or this autonomy and empowerment. Is there ever like a conflict? I wouldn't say conflict, but you know, it depends on, I think the generation, um, the older generation still believe, and unfortunately it comes from women as well, that women um, shouldn't be in the workforce. The, the, the middle generation is now coming and saying, okay, I want my daughter to be educated. I didn't get this opportunity. I want to see her educated. And if that mom is educated, she's going to educate her daughter, right? And it's just going to pay it forward. But I'm not, I'm seeing a lot of guys coming forward and saying, yes, we need this. We need women, female empowerment. We need equality, gender equality. And so three out of the four uh, volunteers that I have in um, Uganda are male. And two That's of them so cool. teach on my um, team. One is the photographer who captures what we do. He follows me around all four days and captures what we do and helps the girls with the technical aspects of the camera. And the other one helps teach the editing and the filmmaking after I leave in conjunction with what I do. Um, and then we got a lady who came on board recently who mark, who's uh, teaching the marketing and how to be seen and social media. And then we've got a, you know, Venix who, who's there to help me oversee everything and keep contact between all the stakeholders. It's so in depth. Like there's so many layers to it, right? Like you said, I'm not just teaching them how to do it, use a camera. I'm like, this is like a whole year that's like changing your life in a sense, like leadership, how to maybe yep. be a business owner, how to of self-empowerment and like tell stories and is yeah. there a particular student or maybe if it's a couple of students that come to mind that you really notice like a huge shift or <laughs> something I mean maybe it's in all of them I don't know oh, yeah but yeah so Brandy uh took our course in 2019 and I call her a powerhouse uh, because she was out of the 15 girls, she was very outspoken and she asked the most questions and she was just like, she was there. But after we finished, she kind of laid back, right? She was, she couldn't figure out, is it photography? Is it video? Because the, the camera that we give them can do both, but her passion lied in videography. So she's on the slide started learning photography like photography she would send me images every once in a while and i'm like hey you know pick it up um and then she started learning videography but then she started using it to record podcasts so she now has two podcasts one focused on um childhood cancer and she would interview um children and their families uh, suffering from cancer to bring funding to them that one to finish. And now she does what's called the Uganda podcast. And she's integrating herself into in government, but speaking for the youth. And right now she's in Europe on some kind of conference that she's been invited to speak at. She's just incredible. So the next phase is we want to start a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. And she's going to, we're talking to about her and another Sudama heading that. So it's just for the girls between themselves without me, without anybody else, so that they can support each other. But she would be the perfect person. Then there's patients who, I love this story because I was there in June to do our last training. And I met with some of the students the night before my workshop was to begin. And patients, she stayed back after all the other girls left because she wanted to talk to me. So her, Lydia, another student, and I sat around and had another drink. And she's like, okay, I need your advice. And I said, and she goes, and you can't get mad at me. And I'm like, oh, she goes, well, I've been going into work and not getting paid. I said, for how long? She goes, six months. And I said, what? And so she'd had this job forever. She was not getting paid because of COVID. The newspaper could no longer afford to pay her. But, or so they to told her. But I said, are the guys getting paid? She goes, yes. And I said, so do you think a guy would put up with that? And she paused and she said, I guess not. I said, tomorrow, um, and before I could speak up, my other student, Lydia, quiet as a house mouse, Lydia, never spoke a word, speaks up and says, no, 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 you are going to listen to me and you're going to listen to Amina. You're going to take charge of your life. Because of what Cameras for Girls did for me, I now own my own photography business. And I don't let, I don't do any photography unless somebody pays me. If they don't pay me, I don't do it. You got it? So she goes, listen up. So then I said, tomorrow, you're not going into work. You're going to grab your computer. You're going to build that LinkedIn profile that I told you to build like 
two years ago. You're going to sit down and you're going to do it. And you're going to follow your passions for writing because you're a good writer. A month ago, so then I came home and I set up the mentoring program, set her up with a mentor. A month ago, she won Travel Writer of the Year in Uganda. And now she's consulting for other travel brands and has that autonomy and that empowerment and leading her life that she wants to lead, right? And she's not beholden to somebody else to pay her. Yeah, there's a lot of like a lot of success stories, but yeah. those are the two that stand out the most right now. Yeah. It sounds like you're pretty good at like the tough love part too, you know, you have to <laughs> like, be, right? Like yeah. I said, I will be your, I, I said, I am your teacher. I am your friend, but I'm not your mom. You can come out of respect. They call you mom or ma'am or whatever. I said, no, no colonialism here. I'm Amina and we're going to be equals. I might be older, but I will also be tougher. I said, if you don't do the work out because the resources are there to be used, not to be abused, right? Not to be taken advantage of. I'm like just picturing what it's like to be one of the, I just imagine like you coming in like that. And yeah, it just seems like you have your own style. You're doing it your way, super empowering, but also, you know, this is really meaningful and we're here to create something and it's an amazing opportunity. And I guess also you've worked really hard to, mm -hmm. to be there too and to fundraise. And so you want to have the impact and want people that really want to. But at the same time, I'm very careful not to come in and to tell them what they need. I am there to ask them what they need and develop the programming around it. Because I never want to be seen as the quote unquote savior. I'm not. I want to be seen as a partner in supporting them to reach their goals, right? Because there's so many moving parts. Cameras for Girls is just one of those moving parts. Then there's the support on the ground, which is essential to, to what we can achieve. Do most of the girls end up staying in Uganda or have any of them like yeah. moved away or... I, I see eventually Brandy might move away because she'll have those up. Like now she's getting that viewpoint living, you know, visiting out Europe and seeing what life is truly like outside mm -hmm. of Uganda and the money that they can earn with it. You know, right now a girl will do a article and she's paid 150,000. I know it's a, it's a ridiculously low amount, like less than $5. But a, a male is paid 17 to 35% higher just because he's a male. So that means they're working by dogs just to make a living every yes. month. And the average income for a Ugandan for an annual income is 250 US dollars. Uh, many of them struggle to even pay for a uh, boda boda, which is a motorcycle ride to go to the editing training. Many of them struggle to pay their rent or their food costs. So we're I'm supporting them with that as well. Mm-hmm. When you're down there and so you're supporting them and then you're seeing all these other challenges, mm -hmm. like how do you stay on your focus and not be like, oh, like how are they going to get here? Food, like do you find then it just, you know what oh, I mean? Yeah. So I look at all of that, right? With a holistic lens, like, okay, so here's the challenge. They need a job. And so here's the camera and the training, this, this nucleus. But then it branches out from there. What other supports do they need? Oh. Well, she needs to get to this job interview, but she doesn't have the money. Oh, she needs to come to marketing training, but she doesn't have the money. She doesn't have a job. So I send her money to get just for boda boda rides just to go to the training, right? Which will pay off in spades because now she's learning how to be seen. So it's always that kind of thing. And I always ask them to be masters of their own domain too. I'm asking them, what are you doing to make money? Like, what other things are you trying, right? Like, I am not an empty well. I love these girls like they're my own daughters. But at the same time, I only have so many supports. I only have so much money uh, to go around. And I don't take it out of the charity funds. I take it out of my own uh, savings because that's not the charity's work. So I always ask them, make them figure out a solution. And at that point, if they can't, then I'm, then I'm sending that support. I'm going to share the links and things of how people can go to your website and they can donate. What's sure, the yeah. biggest way that people can support your organization and support this work? 
Well, there's a few ways. Um, we accept uh, new and used donations of cameras, in-kind donations. So uh, we have a lot of people now have found us and it's keeping the stuff out of the landfill and they'll send their stuff. And then I write them an in-kind donation for the value, today's value, not what they bought for it, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, and then there's uh, becoming a monthly donor. By becoming a monthly donor, it helps us sustain our work. Um, it helps us grow. Um, because there's always things to to be funding, right? And we want to be able to grow. And I, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have the funding pots that many Canadian charities have because of our work being done abroad, um, or an or even a one time donor. And then there's always the campaigns that are fun that we're doing. So this year we're doing a Giving Tuesday campaign, just so we can stand out amongst the fray because there's it's the biggest Giving Day of the year and if we were just to say, hey, give us a Giving Tuesday, nobody will see us. But we're doing, for every $25 that's donated, we enter your name into a giveaway with over 20 prizes ranging from the lowest, I think, is a $50 gift certificate to the keg, all the way to a $450 valued camera bag, which is just beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so we've gone out to sponsors, we've gone out to partners, we've gone out to people to say, would you support our gift basket? And they've been just gracious. And then we're doing the year end campaign where it'll be a mail and an email out campaign, but that's also a big way for us to raise funds um, before we hit it off next year with hopefully a photo contest in the first quarter. Wow. I won't say so, more about that because I'm still working on that one. <laughs> okay, cool. So lots of ways for people to absolutely give yeah. and to support your work. And we're always looking for uh, corporate sponsorships uh, because it's a great way for your corporation to be seen uh, doing good in the world, right? You might not have a presence in Africa, but everybody's got a daughter. Everybody's got a sister. Everybody knows a female. And if you can put your mind in that lens, it might be a girl way over in sub-Saharan Africa that you're helping, but you're helping females overall, you know, mm -hmm. beat gender equality, uh, be empowered and beat poverty. Yeah. And how you talk about like they're impacting their sense of self-expression and self-empowerment and mm -hmm. autonomy. So if we sort of like bring back all of this to like inner callings and that theme of inner calling, how do you describe an inner calling? I think it's something that makes your heart beat faster, gives you a purpose for waking up every day. You're not always going to get rich or get paid. Like I'm doing this unpaid, but I do this 24 seven, like it is a full-time job because it is. Um, but that doesn't matter at the end of the day, right? It's, it's the lives that you impact today are going to change this world, even if it's a small small thing right there is that what is there saying you a sand uh, like a grain of sand leads to a bigger hill i don't know i'm not good at these things but it's, you know get the point and i think in an inner calling is something you can't ignore if it's something whether it's charitable or whether it's not whether you are in a job that's not making you happy and you know you see something on the horizon you think oh my god i really want to be doing that do it Life is too short to just say, oh, maybe later. You might be dead before that later comes, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, or some you might get sick or a family member might get sick or and you have responsibilities now. But if it's that inner calling and it's in your head every day when you wake up, when you go to sleep, don't ignore it. Just do it because it's only going to make your world a better place, but also the world a better place. Yeah, I love that part, but it makes your heart you mm -hmm. know, your heartbeat go faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's one of the biggest things that you've learned since you had your first group in 2018? Innovation is key to keep on evolving. That just because you came up with an idea at the beginning doesn't mean that that idea is the only way to do something. There's 10 ways to go at something and you have to look at many different ways. Open up yourself to feedback, collaboration, you know, uh, maybe somebody has an idea how you can do things better. I'm open because I don't know it all. I never set out to be the executive director of a charity, right? Uh, when I set up this, I just set out to say, oh, I want to teach photography and change lives. 
I never imagined that I'd be here four years later, but I haven't gotten here without listening to the advice of people who've come before me or know better than me. And I'm learning every single day. Right now I'm in an two courses. One is to learn how to build a fundraising plan. And the other is to learn how to execute that fundraising plan. Because one thing to build a plan, but not knowing how to execute is another thing, right? And I am an out of the box thinker. I don't like to, that's why I do not work in a J-O-B. I've done a J-O-B and after six months, I either get fired or I quit because I have a big mouth. <laughs> So, um, you know, know yourself, know your inner self. Like if it's something that's calling, if you're in a job in corporate world and that's not making you happy, but you can see yourself in the, as an entrepreneur, go for it. Like worst thing that happens is you're not doing well and you need resources to learn how to be better. That's what life's all about, right? Like just take those trainings and learn and do it. I hear so much like humility in that too, or getting to know yourself, not being afraid to like listen or be open to what might mm-hmm. come and evolving. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that you haven't shared with us that you'd like to? Right now I am doing board recruitment, which is, uh, it's it's fun. It's a lot of work because you get to, it's a lot of interviews that I'm doing, but I'm getting to meet people from all walks of life. Right. And um, it's it's a learning process. I'm learning just as much from them as they're learning about our organization. Um, and it's it's enriching my world in a way, because somebody might say something that I can kind of, you know, use to grow what cameras for girls like I had no idea what impact investing was. And so today's interview with um, a gentleman said, oh, look at impact investing. I went and researched impact investing and I found like a plethora of resources to possible fundraising, right? So I'm like, oh, it's just, it's, you're constantly, I'm constantly, you know, my brain is in 10,000 different pots, whether it's marketing, fundraising, growing this initiative or reaching out girls, supporting a girl, it's everywhere. So I'm hoping that I can grow this team, which will only come through fundraising, right? That's like goes hand in hand, eventually growing my team so I can have full-time staff. And, you know, that'll be, that'll be the day that'll be like, yeah. Yeah. So that's what's next for you, right? Is that like focus? Oh, absolutely. The The focus is right there, the team. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then maybe I can get some sleep. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you've earned it. That's for darn sure. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much. uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share. And, you know, for all the people who um, show us support and show me support and just really appreciate the work that we're doing, um, because it is heartfelt. We we really want to make a difference in the world and we really want to change the world for females, um, at least in Africa for now. And you never know where else. Thank you so much, Amina. Thank you. All right, so that was our interview with Amina Muhammad. I'm going to leave you with some follow-up questions here for further reflection. First, I want to remind you what Amina said. Life's too short. You have to live out your dreams. You have to live for a bigger purpose. What might that be for you? Have you given yourself the opportunity to explore the bigger purpose that you might want or something that you might want to explore. Another question for further exploration is what can you not ignore? And Mina talked about being really passionate about her work in Africa and especially after going there in 2007 and seeing the conditions that the people there lived in, it was just something that she couldn't ignore. Is there a particular cause or a topic or something that keeps coming back for you that maybe you're no longer able to ignore and you'd like to dig into a little bit deeper and see if that's some way that you can live for that bigger purpose. And lastly, where could you bring more humility? At the end of the interview, Amina talked about, you know, she's like, there's lots of things that I don't know and I'm always open to changing and hearing other people's points of view. What is it that you don't know? And where could you bring more humility and perhaps be open to learning from others? Thanks for listening. See you next time.